Amen. Galatians 5, turn there please, get a Bible out. If you didn't bring a Bible, there should be one in the pew for you. Galatians 5. I'm, gonna, I'm coming down here this morning because I just feel like teaching more than preaching. Galatians 5, verse 16, we've been doing this for a while, but it's been a while. I was supposed to preach this here a few Sundays ago, and God changed the message, and then last Sunday I preached something more along the lines of our homecoming theme. But this morning we're going to pick it back up. Galatians 5, verse 16, this is things that we're not supposed to do anymore. Ways that we're not supposed to be anymore. Galatians 5, 16, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, he did not say that you won't have lust in your flesh. Because you're going to have it. But he said you won't fulfill it. Okay? And there's a difference. Everybody gets angry. Amen? But the Bible says, be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. So, everybody gets angry. You can't control that. But you can control what comes out of you when you are angry. You can't not lust after something. But you can control what you do and how you respond to that lust. Okay? If it's something you see out here, look over here. And don't look back. Okay? If it's something you see in your house, turn it off. Turn something else on. Get something else up on your computer screen or whatever it is. But don't fulfill it. Okay? Yeah, I mean, it happens. And the devil, has all, he's waiting on every corner going, Look at this! See this? Okay, and you're going to go, yeah, I see that and I like it. No, can't do that. So that's what he said, walk in the Spirit. When you walk in the Spirit, that means you've got your Bible open or you have been in the Word and you have been in prayer and God's Spirit is with you and you can say, devil, I'm not doing that. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the spirit, you're not... Un hi, Hunter. Hi. He said my name, so i got to say hi. But if you be led of the spirit, you're not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. We preached. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. That was one sermon. Verse 20, idolatry. Preach that. Number, the second thing here in verse 20, witchcraft. Preach that. Number three, hatred. Preach that. Number four is today, variance. What in the world does that mean? And then emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Those last three words cover all the other things, and you say, well, I don't see it in the Bible, and such like will cover that. Because if it's not exactly that, but it's like that, then that's covered. Because some people, and this is variant, some people like to do things that may be questionable and they say it's not expressly written in the Bible, but it's like something expressly written in the Bible. And if it's like it, it's the same as, right? Uh, Romans 1 says something like that. Romans 1, verse 29, 
says, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. And then, see, that's 23 things. And then it says, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. You see, you didn't do it, but you were watching. You didn't do it, but you were with the gang that did. And Cubby, if there's five guys in a car, and there's a bag of methamphetamine in the car, and all five guys say, that ain't mine, that ain't mine, that ain't mine, that ain't mine, that ain't mine. The law says what? It belongs to all y'all. Right? If nobody fesses up, everybody's going down for the bag of, because it's assumed that if you ride with them, then you're about as guilty as they are. Okay? Now, there are exceptions to that, and I understand that, but it's the idea, if you have pleasure in them that do them, you are, Bible says, you're as guilty as they are. So watching it on TV makes you guilty. Watching it on Netflix makes you guilty. Watching it on YouTube makes you guilty. Watching it on porn sites makes you guilty. Watching it here, watching it there, being part of it. There's just, when you stand before God, you're not going to have the excuses that you're dreaming up right now. Amen? So, what is variance? Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, help me to preach this message. Help me to teach it. Lord, I just feel like teaching today. And uh, Lord, help us to learn something. There's always something, Lord, about our character that can be worked on a little bit. There's always something in us, God, that makes us not right. And Father, we're your saints, we're your children, and you're our Father, and you try to teach us things about us like a father would. A father would tell us that we're not throwing the ball quite right, or a father would tell us that the screws go over here instead of there, or a father would tell us that we're not holding the axe handle right. The father would tell us all kinds of things about life, and that's your job, and you're trying to teach us things, and we don't know what variance means, so you're going to teach us today. And so, Lord, teach us about ourselves and how sometimes we might have variance in us. And Lord, help us to be a reflection of you instead of a reflection, God, of our flesh. So, Lord, I pray, dear God, that you just bless the words that come from my mouth. Let them be right. Let them be in accordance with your word. And then let your word go into the hearts of those listening. Let the Holy Spirit, Lord, guide each and every one the way he does, and we'll just leave it up to you for your glory and your benefit. We pray this in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen. Now, here's God's commandment to me. You don't have to turn there, but 2 Timothy 2.25, this is why I have to do these things. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledgement, to the knowledge of the truth. My job is not to try to condemn everybody in the church. My job is to, in meekness, instruct the church and to teach you things that I've learned, teach you things that I, I've had to learn, and even if I'm guilty, I, and I guarantee you, there's 18 things and such like on here, and I guarantee you I'm not innocent of all 18. I guarantee you I'm, I'm just as wrong and wicked 
as everybody else is. God doesn't pick out the, the special guys that never do anything wrong to be the preachers. The fact of the matter is, he'll pick the ones like Jesus, a high priest who went through life like we did so he could be a good high priest, so we could go to him and, and have, he'll have mercy on us because he knows what it was like. And it's the same with a good preacher. He won't be condemning his church. He'll be convicting his church like the Holy Spirit convicted him. So that's my job is to be meek while I'm doing this. So I'm down here today, not up high above everybody. So I had to go to, if you go, if you go to purebiblesearch.com and get our Bible software, one of the things that Donna added to our Bible search software was a Webster's Dictionary. Why Webster's? Because Webster, Noah Webster, took the English language and he defined a lot of the words based upon the way they were used in the King James Bible. So that you could get a good, decent definition, you could get a biblical definition of what these words meant. And at the bottom of the Bible search software, Donna slipped that in, the entire original Webster's, not the moderated one that they've added all these slang terms now, the original Webster's Dictionary, the one that's closest to the King James Bible. That's what she did. And so I consulted that. Because the word variance is only two times in the whole Bible. So it's kind of hard to get a definition. One of the places is in Matthew 10, 35, where it says, I'm come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother. Aaron doesn't mind me. I see by the smile on her face, she don't mind me. She's not down here hiding behind her hymn book. Aaron's mother hates her, hates the church that she decided to go to. And Christ is the one who set her at variance against her own mother. Now, she's still under the fifth commandment. Honor thy father and thy mother. She still has an obligation to honor her mother, not curse her mother, not condemn her mother, not tell her mother that she's all kinds of filthy Jezebel and this and that and the other. Her mother doctrinally is dead wrong. Her mother is a idol-worshiping Roman Catholic who thinks the Pope tells her what to do instead of the Bible. And... At some point, Aaron tried to witness to her mom, am I right? Tried to witness to her mom and say, Mom, let me show you what the Bible says. And her mom said, I ain't going to listen to you. You're part of that cult. I don't, I don't want to talk to you anymore. Am I getting this right so far? See, she hadn't told me this. I got it figured out. So she got in a car and drove from California to Festus. Part of that was so she could honor her mother, not getting in fights with her all the time. And when her mother dies, she's going to go to the funeral and honor her mother. That's what's right. But she decided that she was going to believe God's word over any man, including me, and including the Pope. Including the church councils that told her mother that she has to pray to Mary in order to get to Jesus, in order to get to God. That's not in your Bible, and that's, that's wicked. Mary's not your Savior. She's not your Redeemer. She did not suffer like Christ did on the cross, and that's what they say about her, and that's all a lie. So this, this, listen, this verse is right. He set the daughter against her mother because her mother refuses to believe the Word of God and she decided she was going to believe nothing but the Word of God and that is what set the variant. She didn't grow up rebellious. I mean, I know her. She, she's a nice lady. Okay? 
She just, she just nice, sweet, okay? She not mean like me sometimes, okay? But she's at, God set her at, var at variance against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. So that's, that's the only other place the Bible uses that word variance. So the synonym for variance is opposition, opposing. You find that in 2 Thessalonians 2. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth. The Antichrist is at variance with God. That means if God says it's white, Antichrist says, no, it's not, it's black. If God said this is good and right, the Antichrist and his spirit says, no, it's not. It's, it's wrong. So, you've got liberals all over the country who are saying it's right for two men to marry each other. And God said, no, it's not. It's wrong. So, the man of sin and those liberals are at variance against the Word of God. And the Word of God is at variance against them. Does that make sense to everybody? That's what that word means. So, now I've got written up there on the top, variance, against, contrary to, deliberately oppositional, defiant. Or in other words, there are some people who say... Rules are made to be broken, or rules, these rules are not for me. That's what they say. It doesn't matter what the Bible says. They are at variance against it. They're not going to believe it. They're going to speak out against it. And you're not going to change their mind. If God changes their mind, then it's God that does it. But other than that, they are just going to be oppositional to God's word. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter what's preached. Doesn't matter what it says. I've heard preachers tell, one, one preacher, Brother Reg Kelly, said that he's preaching about families and moms and dads straightening out their children with the rod of correction. The Bible teaches clearly that a, the heart of a child is desperately wicked and it's evil. And foolishness is bound in the heart of a child and the rod of correction drives it far from them. And so the Bible teaches us parents in love to use a rod to correct our children. To use spanking or a whipping or whatever. My mother used my belt. My own belt made me mad. The words that I never wanted to hear from my mother was, give me your belt. Because I knew that she wasn't going to go buy me a new one. Except she wore that one out on me. But my mother taught me the lesson that if I did wrong, then the rod of correction had to be applied to me in order to straighten my mind out. And what we've got in our country now is a bunch of snowflakes that have been raised by parents with no correction. And when they get to be adults, then, these are the ones who hate cops. These are the ones who hate law enforcement. These are the ones who hate any kind of authority over them. So they're the ones out in the street marching, saying, let's tear down the wall that we're building down in Arizona because the rules that are trying to keep illegal people out of our country should, let's break those rules. Let's tear down the walls. Let's go in opposition to the laws of this country, the Constitution of the United States. They care nothing about because they've been raised to do whatever they want to do. I said I was going to teach. And here I'm preaching. It's just hard for me to reel that in sometimes. 
But that's what we got in our country. We got a, uh, we've got a generation of people in variance to any rule or any kind of correction whatsoever. And these people are now in our churches. But they're not necessarily in churches like this. Because we'll preach sin and we'll preach it because we're sinners. And we need correction by God. Can I hear God's people say amen? We need the correction. So they'll go and they'll find churches where things like that are not preached because they're not going to listen to that. They're not going to have that. They're not going to, they're not going to, that, that kind of preaching and that kind of teaching, they don't want anything to do with it because it forces rules upon them and they don't follow rules. Especially the ones laid down by God. Because that's how they were raised. So that's that part of variance. And so, now Bethel Church, listen to me. If God said, the sky is blue, what color is the sky? You know I'm setting you up, don't you? If God said murder is wrong, if God said human life starts at conception, in fact, if you read the Bible, it actually starts, God has a name written down for everybody. It actually starts before the foundation of the world. And if a doctor goes in and kills that baby, is that murder? God said that was murder. See, this kind of stuff I'm talking about, God said it's murder, but they don't want to hear that. Because they vote for all the abortion people to get in office. And they don't want to hear it. So that's variance. And what I'm just simply saying to you is, if God's word says, don't do this, and you do it, then you're guilty of variance. Because you're either going to admit, you're, listen to me, you're either going to admit that God was right and you know you're doing wrong. So why are you doing wrong willfully? Or you're going to say, well, I know the Bible says something like that, but I don't believe that's for me, and so I'm going to do it anyway. That's variant. I can't be the one to say who that applies to. That's up to you, between you and God. It's my responsibility to know in me that if God said don't do it, if I do it, I'm wrong. And two things have to happen. Number one, I have to confess it and repent it. That's number one. And number two, I have to ask God that if it's a problem that I cannot overcome, I have to ask God to help me get to the place where I'm not doing that anymore. Because if the preacher says, I know it says this in the Bible, but I do it, and I don't think there's anything wrong with it. If the preacher says that, you've got a big problem on your hands. Because what, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to start preaching to you that you can disobey God's word and it'll be okay. That's variance. And God said that's a work of the flesh. And he said anybody who does that is not going to heaven. So I can't ignore God's rules. I don't wear a hat when I stand up here and preach to everybody. Why do I not wear a hat when I stand up here and preach to everybody? God said, don't do it. So if I come in here with a Think Bible hat that we have, if I come in here wearing my Think Bible hat in the house of God, number one, my mima would come up out of the grave and swat me with a switch. Because my Meemaw knew what's right and wrong. 
But if I did that, somebody here or somebody online would say, look what he's doing. Why is he doing that? That's against the Word of God. So I can't. I got a camera on me seven days a week almost. And if I do something wrong, I guarantee you somebody says something about it. Sometimes somebody makes a video about it. So, if I can't get away with it, why can you? So I have to worry about what I'm doing and to make sure that what I'm doing is right with God or I'm at variance and I'm doing it, I'm either doing it and I know it's wrong or I'm doing it and saying it's not wrong for me. Either way, it's wrong and I can't do it. I looked at, I'm not going to give you, I'm not going to hold you through all of this. Say amen. Okay? I'm not going to hold you through all of this. But I looked at, if you look in the Pure Bible Search software, he gives several definitions for the word variance. This is number one. I'm going to give you this. So the variance sermon is going to take me a few months. <laughs> no, Couple, couple sermons. Number one, in law, an alteration of something formerly laid in a writ. So like Sterling, let's say Sterling wants to uh, add three boards to his porch. But Jefferson County said, if you pull a nail out of your nail bag, you better have a certificate, what is that, a permit, and we have to examine those three boards to make sure they come in accordance with the laws and the guidelines and what is it that's in place and that we hate, planning and zoning. We better make sure that those three boards are in accordance with our planning and zoning schedule and that they don't violate our specific recommendations now if you want you can appeal this and get a variance a legal variance to it because the committee said it was okay but if you pull a nail out of a nail bag in jefferson county you better have that little certificate there saying that they said you could put three nails in your porch okay so that it you can get a legal variance Believe it or not, there were some guys in the Old Testament who at Passover time, they had been picking up dead bodies and God said, if you touch a dead body, you're unclean seven days for various reasons and the Jews were the cleanest people in the whole world and so God said, you're unclean seven days. Well, they had touched and picked up and disposed of dead bodies, but that made them unclean at Passover time and they could not participate in Passover. So they went to Moses and they said, Moses, here we are. We're trying to follow the law. But then in following the law, we had to violate the law of Passover. What? We're stuck. And so Moses went to God and God said, I got, I got that one. The next month, we'll have a second Passover. And what that is, that's a picture of the second coming. Because Israel was dirty at Christ's first coming. They were all unclean, and they were not worthy. So God said, I'm going to clean them up for the second one. Amen? So God ordained a second Passover so that if you were unclean at the first, you don't touch dead bodies because you're going to get ready for the second one. God made an exception. He made a legal variance. Right? So yes, there are times when there are legal variances, and you're not necessarily breaking rules. But, if you just decide on your own to alter God's word, guilty of variance, an alteration of something formerly laid in a writ or a difference between a declaration and a writ or the deed on which it is grounded. Deuteronomy 12, 28. Let's hear your Bibles go. 
But Deuteronomy, you might, you might want to underline this phrase, this passage in your Bible. You just might need this one day. This might come up on Facebook. Deuteronomy 12, 28. Observe and hear how many words? All these words which I command thee, that it may go well with thee and with thy children after thee forever. See, you're supposed to teach the same Bible to your children. When thou doest that which is good and right in the sight of who? The Lord. You do that which is good and right in the sight of the Lord. That means that what you're fixing to do something, right? And you're thinking, can I do this according to the word of God? Now, I'm going to be honest with you. We got, a, we got something that the board, I want you to pray for the men in our board. We have a decision to make. And we have to make sure that we're following Scripture in this decision. I'm not telling you what it is. But I want you to pray for the guys on our board that they get this thing right. I mean, this, this, this is important. Because if our church ain't right, if we just go ahead and do something and God said no, God ain't going to bless this place. We'll lose. Listen, God will shut off every camera. We'll lose our internet connections. He'll shut down our radio stations. He'll close down this whole deal. Do you believe that? I do. So watch this. Judges 17, 6. In those days, there was no king in Israel. You know what your king is? A King James Bible. That's your king. If you have no king... It's because your Bible is closed and there is nothing ruling your life. You have decided that you can do it best on your own. You can make your own decisions. You can do your own thing. You can do whatever you want to do. And you don't need no Bible telling you what to do. That's the spirit of Antichrist. Because when the Antichrist opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God... In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the Antichrist is in opposition not just to God, the being that's on the throne in heaven, but this Bible, the Word, is called God. He's in opposition to what's in the Bible. And so are you if you decide that you don't need the Bible telling you what to do in your life. You're at variance. So in those days there was no king in Israel, and so look at it. But every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Ian, do you trust your own eyes? Don't trust them. Well, preacher, I don't see anything wrong with what I'm doing. You, have, you ever heard, have you ever heard that one before? Have you... I'm not going to ask you if you've ever said it before. I don't see anything wrong with what I'm doing. I don't see anything wrong with how I live this way. I don't see any... You're just doing that which is right in your own eyes. You ain't got no king. And you're var you have variance. You, you just... Again, you're either breaking it ignorantly... And you could be taught what to do, or you're breaking it willingly, and you know you're guilty, and you feel bad for it, or you're breaking it willfully because you say, well, that doesn't apply to me, I don't have to do that. It's like the guy that asked his preacher, they had a bunch of women speaking in tongues and preaching and prophesying and all this stuff behind a pulpit, and he went to his preacher and he said, preacher, right here in the Bible, he said, right here, he said, let your women be silent in the church. And the preacher said, that's not for us. So in other words, they can do whatever they want to do. And we say it's okay, even though God doesn't. That's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. Judges 21, 25, in those days there was no king in Israel. See, they did it again. 
Four chapters later, doing it again. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Did you know we kind of go in cycles like that? Don't we? Now this is the last place I want you to turn. Turn to 1 Kings 11 and then I'm going to let you go. 1 Kings 11 and then I'm going to shoot you home. I love this church. I love this church. I want us to keep I want I want us I want to keep saying what's right. No matter how hard it is on you, no matter how hard it is on me. No matter if it's you doing it and no matter if it's me doing it. If it's me doing it especially, I got to say it. I'm just not going to tell you everything that I'm doing. Is that okay? Because if it's not, then we're going to know what everything you're doing. Thank you, Ian. I know there's still some good churches out there, but they're few. They're few. 1 Kings 11. This in the days of Jerobo Jeroboam used to be Solomon's servant. And Jeroboam ended up becoming, if you, if you remember where God said, if, if Solomon sinned, I'll chasten him with the stripes of men. Do you know who one of the stripers was? was Jeroboam. Jeroboam ended up rebelling against Solomon, going out on his own, gathering and following, and he was a scourge to Solomon all the days. That Solomon had it easy with the exception of Jeroboam scourging him all the time. If it hadn't been for Jeroboam, Solomon would have just had the easiest life in the world. But God made sure that guys like Jeroboam were a thorn in his flesh. And he said to Jeroboam, Take thee ten pieces, for thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I will rend the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon, and will give ten tribes to thee. But he shall have one tribe for my servant David's sake, and for Jerusalem's sake, the city which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. Now I want to stop right here, and I want to give you a, a second lesson. I know I'm holding you, but just hang with me, please. Do you know why God ripped the nation of Israel in half? It wasn't necessarily for the sins of Solomon. Whose was it? The sins of David. David's already dead and gone. And God is ripping the kingdom of David in half and taking ten tribes away from his lineage because David cheated on his wife with Bathsheba. Listen to me. You think that your sins hurt nobody. You have no idea what you're doing to your grandchildren. God will end up cursing your grandchildren long after you're dead, and they're going to have to pay for your stupid sin. That's why he did it. Look at verse 33. Because they have forsaken me and have worshipped Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, and Milcom, the god of the children of Ammon, and have not walked in my ways to do that which is right in mine eyes, and to keep my statutes and my judgments, and David, as David did his father. One thing that David did wrong, and now everybody's having to pay the price for it. God said, if you're going to do it, Make sure it's my rules and my way. And if not, don't do it. That's the lesson. That's it. Done. I want you to bow your head. Not, I'm just going to have a time of prayer. Now, if you just eat up with guilt and you want to run down here, come on down. I guarantee you, you won't be the only one. Or shouldn't be the only one. Because all of us have got a little variance in us. All of us want to kind of cheat the rules a little bit. And say, well, I'm saved. God's grace will cover it. I did this. I know it's wrong, but God's grace will cover it. I got by with it. Don't do that. Parents, 
teach this to your children. Or they're going to grow up liberals and vote pro-abortion and pro-sodomite. Your children are going to do this. If you don't raise them right, teach them that they can't break mom and daddy's rules and get by with it. Because they're going to break mom and daddy's rules. Teach them they can't get by with it. Father in heaven, I love you. I thank you for these people. I thank you for this church. I love this church. I love these people. And God, out of all the people in this church that you should have tossed out, it should have been me. I am just as guilty, if not more, than anybody sitting here. And God, you didn't let me get by with anything. That's for sure. I learned my lesson. And you've helped me. And God, teach me what's right and wrong. Because I still got a wicked nature and I just... God, I want to do things that are wrong. I want to say things that are wrong. I want to go against people. I want to hurt people sometimes. God, I ain't right. God, I'm not right. And so, God, I love this church, and I can't, I can't just condemn them while I stand here smug. I can't do it. You told me to in meekness, teach them that oppose themselves. They're breaking their own rules. So you ask me, God, to teach my people what's right and what's wrong. And the bottom line is, if the Bible says it's wrong, then it's wrong. There's no way out of it. There's no... loopholes it just it's wrong it's wrong to do this it's wrong to do that they know it as much as I do and except Lord they're babes in Christ and they have to be taught some of the very basic things most of the people in this church Lord they know they've read the Bible they know what they know what's right and they know what's wrong and our problem is God we just go ahead and do things that are wrong we're, that makes us at variance. And we're not right. And God, I've learned, and still am learning, that I'm not the convictor. You are. And as much as I've tried, Lord, at times to convict people that they're wrong, I can't do it. It never works. But if you do it, Father, it'll work. And God, you love these people more than I do. And I'm sorry for thinking otherwise. So, Father, you convict as you desire. And I'll stay out of it. And, Father, Lord, teach us right and wrong. And, Lord, help us to pray right now, God, each one of us. To ask you, God, that if we get out of line, you take a rod and you put us with that rod back in line where we need to be so that we don't do that which was right in our eyes. We do it right in your eyes. Father, dismiss us in your love and in your care and in your mercy. Have grace, Lord, upon each one of us because that's the only way we can live. We love you and trust you in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. If you get up, you're dismissed.